when you think about it, we challenge our people every single day to be creative, to be intellectually amazing, to deliver consistently on really complex tasks. And oftentimes our business success really relies on their success and their accomplishments, especially now, right? When you think about what we're all going through with the pandemic and, and how COVID-19 is impacting our businesses, the outcome itself is really hard to predict. Welcome to Grow Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? Today, we're going to talk about honesty, the truth. More specifically, we're going to talk about the importance of transparency. Given all of the stuff that we've been through as individuals and in, in our families and in our organizations, transparency is even more important now than ever before because there's a lot of uncertainty. We want to inspire trust in others, right? Well, today we're going to look at transparency in midst of a crisis. The crisis being, how do we all come back together? How do we all move forward, maybe with more clarity? But transparency in a crisis is something that we're going to talk about with a very special CEO. He is the CEO of InTouch Controls. They do um, HVAC, energy management systems. I, I won't get into the details, but when I talked to John Bolin about transparency, he lit up. He really shared why it's so important. He actually shared a little bit of a, a vulnerable moment of where, why he left an organization early in his professional career because he wasn't getting transparency. It was very frustrating. And so as he's evolved as a leader, He's talked about why transparency is important. Inside the interview, we, we look at the details of transparency. Where do you draw the line? And he shared a few examples of employees that took the level of transparency that they had around financials and came up with new ideas or new ways to, for the company to really grow together. This is a special interview that I'm happy to share with you. And if you haven't had a chance to take on the free training, we want to remind you right now that you can go to genehammett.com forward slash training. There's three mistakes that every leader makes in their journey of growth. And when you understand when those mistakes, you can actually address them. Be intentional. You want to be intentional about how you're growing as a leader, right? Well, these are new. These are special. And if you haven't already gone to genehammett.com forward slash training, it's absolutely free for you to key into the three mistakes so that you can build a team of A players through this recession. Now here's the interview with John. Before we dive into the interview, I wanted to remind you that you can actually get a tool that I've been working with clients with for the last couple of years. I've refined this tool that's gone through several iterations. Now we have it completely automated. You can actually go online and fill out the leadership quiz. To get the leadership quiz, just go to theleadershipquiz.com. That's pretty easy, right? Theleadershipquiz.com. What you will get when you do that is you will answer a few questions you will see where you rate based on the core principles of fast growth companies. If you're ready to grow your company or you want to see where you are, then make sure you go to theleadershipquiz.com. Inside it, you will get insight to where you are, understand where you want to improve, and you will get them mapped into the 10 areas that are most specific to fast growth companies. Again, go to theleadershipquiz.com and you can get that right now. Hey, John, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Gene? Fantastic. Excited to have you on the podcast. Well, it's good to be here. Well, I've already let our audience know a little bit about you and the leadership and, and what we're going to talk about today, but I would love for you to tell us about InTouch Controls. Well, InTouch is an energy management uh, solutions provider who, where we've organized all of our core principles around driving profitability and increasing multi-site customers' ability to run their businesses and reach their sustainability goals so that we can all save the planet one building at a time. Love that. That's a sharp little elevator pitch you got. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've been working some time to craft it, but uh, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really encouraging to work in a business that's driving so many technology advancements, but at the same time, um, we can accomplish some great things for a larger community. So it's, it's a big business to be part of. And John, you've been the CEO for InTouch for how long? I've been the CEO for InTouch uh, for about nine months. 
Okay. And I've been with in touch for about seven years. All right. Well, a piece of my st the story I didn't know. So I'm glad you shared that with me. Yeah. When you think about um, growing a fast company, there's many different elements we could talk about, but me and my team have been looking at your style of leadership and your approach to you know, culture and people. And the word transparency keeps coming up. Um, why is transparency so important in today's world? Yeah, that's, a, it's a, that's a great question. And it takes me back, um, I'm gonna go back in the, in the way back machine 25 years, right? So I was one of the youngest directors in a privately held company. I reported directly to the president President and CEO, I'm this fairly new, newly minted MBA. We, uh, we were in the convenience store marketing uh, business and the fuel management business. And we had decided due to the deregulation of the trucking industry that we were going to remake this fuel hauling business. Now mind you, I'm a newly minted MBA. The only thing, thing I know about 18 wheel trucks is that they had 18 wheels. But I was a pretty darn good internal consultant. So I had laid out this plan by what we needed to do, the core talent we needed to bring and maintain internally so we could keep serving our existing business, the assets we needed to sell off. I had a rock solid plan that myself and my team had put together and I presented it to the president and CEO and they said, no, we're not gonna do it that way. And I was like, yeah, but, but we need to do this. He said, no, in fact, just pick two people. There's 200 people in this company. Just pick two people you need, the, the two smartest, and just pick the trucks you need, the drivers, and we'll just get going. And they had a larger commercial reason for doing this. One that they, quite frankly, here I am 25 years later, I, I have some suppositions about why they wanted to do this. But for me, as a young leader, they just made my job infinitely harder. I had to ask my people to solve for core knowledge that they didn't have, to understand trucking regulations that they couldn't possibly know. And meanwhile, we had to maintain some level of delivery of fuel to these large convenience stores in a way that was virtually impossible to hit. I mean, they, 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 they almost set us up for failure to begin with. Now, mind you, we were successful in the end, but I was deeply frustrated and I ended up leaving the company a year later. And I was their rising star, but I was the guy. I mean, I was the youngest leader in the, on the leadership team. And when you think about it, we challenge our people every single day to be creative, to be intellectually amazing, to deliver consistently on really complex tasks. And oftentimes our business success really relies on their success and their accomplishments, especially now, right? When you think about what we're all going through with the pandemic and, and how COVID-19 is impacting our businesses, the outcome itself is really hard to predict. And so we have to be able to make hard decisions, whether, it's around spinning off another company as this organization was, whether we may or may not have to reduce headcount in the future and, and or invest in a different way. And if our people don't understand the challenges that are in our business, that are driving those decisions, then why should we expect them to keep following us? I didn't, right? I made the decision to leave because I was so frustrated because I was working so hard but I didn't know why. Why did you make my job that much harder? Why did you have to make that decision? It might have been perfectly rational. And I feel certain that myself and my peers would have enjoyed sitting down at a table with our, at that time, my CEO and have him say, look, here are the reasons we have to do this. It, and it, it astounds me that other folks feel like, no, the better answer was to hide that information from, the, from, from your best and brightest. Hold on for a second. John just said, we challenge our people. It was very fast. I want to bring a spotlight to this because when you challenge your people, you give them an opportunity to step up. You give them an opportunity to think for themselves, to not be afraid to make a mistake. When you truly give them that opportunity and you challenge themselves, you're not there to guide them. You're not there to you know, tell them how to do it. You want them to take ownership of it. The best way I know to encourage more leadership across the company is not to talk about it, but to actually let people lead, let people own the projects, the result, the process, let them own it. This is something I talk about quite a bit, so make sure you figure out how to challenge your employees and challenge yourself as well as a leader. Back to John. I wanna ask you, John, you've talked about the past and I totally get the story and how it relates here, but I wanna ask you about today. We've, we're coming out of COVID 
and um, hopefully coming out of it. <laughs> We're kind of still Not in the middle of it a little bit. Yeah. But why is transparency so important now or even more important? Well, you know, I, I, I touched on it a, a little bit, but to, to drive a little deeper, you know, and, and we'll take kind of call it March 13th, plus or minus 24 hours when the entire, when the entire United States essentially turns the lights off and we all take our businesses um, remote. Uh, but we all still have to, to run our businesses. We have to pay our employees. We have to, we have to create livelihoods for our employees and deliver our value proposition to our customers. And in my business, I've had four of my customers seek chapter 11 protection, right? So what that really means is there's a level of uncertainty in my business. There's a chance that I have to change headcount. There's a chance that some of us in these high growth businesses have to pivot. We may have to sell to new customers with new products. And these decisions are really challenging. Now we've been very fortunate. I've not had to reduce headcount through um, this pandemic. We've been able to manage our business very effectively and cut costs in certain places. But I immediately began communicating with my employees. In the, in the early days, I was on a 48 to 72 hour all hands communication, whether it was by email or, or over video, making sure they knew exactly where the business stood. And we're talking about, this is how much AR we have. This is how much cash we have. This is what our payables are. This runway of cash allows us 12 months without selling another product. This runway of cash allows us 18 months, right? really letting them understand all of the planning that we were doing financially because I needed them to be at their best. And I needed them to understand that we would give them as many answers as we possibly could to some of their unspoken questions. And if we weren't giving them information, it wasn't because we were hiding it, it was because we didn't know. And it was okay that we didn't know. It was okay that we didn't have all the answers. Our goal is to lead them in the face of uncertainty. Right? Good Lord, if we had roadmaps, we'd all be good at this, right? I mean, the, the, the issue is we don't. And it was important to let them know that we were all blazing the, the most appropriate trail. So if I do have to make a hard decision, and again, I've been very fortunate. I've, I've had to make cost reduction decisions. I've had to change salaries, but I haven't had to reduce heads. But I, I truly believe that if I went to my team and I made some decisions around headcount, and I showed them why, that while they wouldn't be happy about it, they would trust that I made the best decision I could. And you know, I, the, the most important thing we can do is create that bond between ourselves and our employees so that when you have to make hard decisions, we can make them, and you can make them without your best and brightest doing what I did 25 years ago, which is going, you know what? There's gotta be somebody else out there that'll tell me the truth. Hold on for a second. Did you catch how John talked about employees making decisions? Have you ever gotten an email from an employee that asking for permission on something or asking a question when you really wish they just would have known or just done it anyway? Whatever they asked, they just had the idea in their head about what should be done and they just did it. They didn't bother you about it. Well, that's a sign that your leadership model is broken. If you are getting emails or you're getting questions about things that people should have the confidence and courage to make decisions for themselves. Your job is to let them make those decisions, set expectations, maybe even set some boundaries or guide rails around what is expected of them. And your job then is to get out of the way. When you think about getting your employees to make decisions, isn't that really kind of the end goal is to empower them enough to have those ideas and make decisions when you're not in the room? Because here's the key. You can't always be in the room. And so you want to trust that they know what to do when you're not around and you want them to continue doing it, even if you're on vacation for a month, let's say. I remind you of this because empowering your people is a part of leadership. Back to John. I want to ask you a question here, and I call this the transparency line. Where okay. do you draw it? There's always a, a place where people are willing to, to put that line those with remarkable or even radical transparency push it toward what's legally possible. Uh, others find a way that's closer to, well, this makes sense. Where do you draw yeah. the line? Um, I'm closer to legally possible than, com than comfortable. Um, there's, you know, they, I, I would tell you, and you know, I present virtually unvarnished to my entire team, uh, our board deck after every single board meeting. It's one of the core things that I do. Um, there is very little, 
that I will remove from that deck before I present it to the entire company. Um, and there are two themes that I am careful and they, and they bounce up against, um, I'll say the legal line, one for sure, which is to the extent that there's any third party investment discussions, things along those lines, uh, you know, any sort of uh, M&A kind of discussions that you might have with the board, until those are fully fleshed out, that would be inappropriate to share for a number of, I think, pretty obvious reasons, right? It's, it's um, so I, I, I'm very careful with speculative kind of comments that I would share in a broader, a broader room, only because I don't have the opportunity to put them in context and, and out of respect for other parties, people outside of my company. Um, the, the other area is um, any place where we, um, I would say, project headcount, things along those lines, that again are forecasted and not certain. But, but to be clear, right, you know, we had a, uh, a COVID-19 action plan, right? And so sort of the things we had done and then the sort of the in case of emergency break glass um, items. And we actually laid out what those actions are. And for the most part, all we did was redact names or roles or things along those lines. But, but basically my employees knew there was a bigger list that if things didn't go well, we had already mapped out what our core actions were gonna be. Um, so I would say where I draw the line is anything that I think would be incendiary or not helpful and create much more emotion. But up to that, right, the, you know, again, the, the easy ones, the financial statements. Right? Those are, you know, to the extent that we're sharing that with the board, there's a 100% transparency with, um, with my team. Right? They, they see our cash projection 12 months out. And we are not a cash flow positive business in most financial periods, right? We are a, we're a very traditional venture backed high growth company that has a burn rate. And when you look at cash and if you don't understand these kinds of companies, especially folks from bigger companies, the, our cash line kind of freaks you out. And you know what, if you're going to work in this business, then I'm going to help you understand why you shouldn't be freaked out. And I'm going to share that with you. And so you know what it means to me and what it might mean to you. John, what links have you taken, um, maybe even personally, but, but just engaging in other resources to help people understand those financials. You know, I, I, it's funny you say that. Um, I, I have become, and to a lesser extent, my CFO, a bit of a teacher at times, right? So when I first started presenting the board deck, um, rather than, you know, pr provide people classes and whatnot, um, it was a fairly parochial delivery of the first deck that I delivered to the entire team. So when a financial slide came up, I literally walked up to the screen and walked them through the financial statement and said, these are the key metrics that our board looks at. This, you know, this revenue metric here um, and, and its trajectory matters because of this, right? This, this recurring revenue versus this non-recurring, this matters because of this. And outside investors value us more on this recurring piece than they do on this non-recurring piece. By the way, our gross margins, which are really healthy, are really exciting to people, and this is our target, right? So in general, we like to drive to a target of a 50-point gross margin in our business, and here's why. And walk them all the way through, walk them through, here's what makes up our OPEX. You know, so you know, 80% of our operating expense tends to be headcount. That means you guys, right? And this is how that's calculated. So as you guys might understand, if we're trying to grow the business and doing well, we're gonna add headcount, because that's, that is the dry powder we can use to grow the business. But if we fail, and we don't hit this revenue plan that we all signed up to with the board, they're not gonna let us change our number down here on profitability. They're gonna expect us to hold the line, which means the, the number one place we'd look to cut expense is headcount, right? And we had that conversation with the whole company, laid it out, broke down the metric and exploded it for them. So they understood where the costs in the business were and why we pushed so hard on, and, on, on certain initiatives. And, 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 and when you do that, what you get is very adult decisions. I mean, the, the most, uh, um, I say gratifying part of this is not the fact that you get to tell them this, it's actually the response you get back, right? So, so yes, you want, you want folks to trust you and you want them to believe in you when you make these hard decisions, but you also want them to think creatively about how to change the business, right? So a, a, a similar conversation I had with my team around the same time we were starting sort of this, um, you know, I'd say, significant culture change at Entouch to, to drive this information into the team was, by the way, guys, the reason we want to start this communication is because the next best idea 
the next great idea for Entouch, we cannot hope that it comes from inside this leadership team. We should hope it comes from outside this leadership team. It'd be great if it, if it maybe coexisted, but the reality is they're smarter than we are. They know more about our business than we do. Like we can sit in here in, the, in, in our leadership team meetings and think that we know everything, but all of the real work's being done by our extended team. And if you create this environment, then you can challenge them to come back at you and say, you know, guys, now that you understand how the business is managed, now that you understand what's important, help us make it better. And so we've had folks try to find ways to, to you know, I've actually recently, we, we spent a lot of money on bandwidth and cellular bandwidth because we're, we play very heavily in the IOT space. I've had junior people come to me and say, I think we could save money on our cellular communications by doing these things. Um, I just had a young woman who's one of my favorite hires of all time. She's right in just the sweet spot of her career. She's probably, I'm going to guess, late 20s, early 30s. I don't really know, but just um, an amazing young woman, incredible member of her family. And um, I challenged the team to come up with new ideas. She scheduled a meeting with me. This is two weeks ago. and said, I have an idea about how we can change um, our revenue streams and take our current products and pivot them and maybe sell them to a new set of customers because I understand what the value proposition is that my customers and their partners are getting from our software. And so she scheduled an hour long discussion with me, came prepped with a modest business plan about something we could do to drive more recurring business into our P and L. And that's a, you know, that's a customer success manager and a customer facing organization who just feels empowered to be able to do that. And that's why you do it. You don't do it because you feel good and you show them the P&L. And later when you have to make a reduction, they don't think you're as bad as you might have been. You do it because they feel like they can participate in the management of the business. And, and they're going to make you smarter. John, I appreciate that story so much because it is why I think transparency is so important. If we as leaders draw the line and have an us versus them conversation consistently, they never feel what I call the sense of ownership or the feeling of ownership. And what you just described was someone who saw value out there that the company could tap into within the right guidelines and had a conversation with you. It could have been a terrible idea. It could have been a great idea, but you had the idea and right. you get to decide how we move forward. And that's what we want our employees to do. Absolutely. I, you, I, go ahead. I, I actually, I mean, one of the most moving really two of the most moving conversations I've had recently is as we were entering the pandemic and we laid out everything we needed to do um, and what we were doing, we talked to them. So we, we proactively deferred um, a significant amount of executive compensation. Uh, we did, we made no um, uh, pay reductions to anybody below the leadership team and laid all of this out, told them what we were doing and essentially said, we're going to do our level best to protect everybody else. And, to again, a, a, a little bit of luck and a whole lot of work and we've been able to do that. But right at the beginning, after we delivered that presentation to the team, and I say you know, that I delivered that presentation to the team, I had one person come to me and say, look, um, it's actually a fairly recent hire. So to some extent, I'll, I'll call it a little bit of self-preservation, but still it, it goes right to why you wanna do this. And he said, I couldn't help but think as I was sitting in that room, everybody else's contributions to what we're trying to do. And I can't really deliver that much. I'm a highly compensated person who just got here. Um, I'd like to raise my hand to be furloughed. And I said, excuse me. And he said, I, I just don't think it's right. I don't think I can add value right now. And listening to everything else that you guys are doing, um, I, I, I would, if, if you're okay with it, if you can help me with my benefits, um, I can survive a little bit and just be furloughed. I just want to work here. And I really, I really want to do what I can. So that was conversation one. Conversation two happened right before that. I met with each of my individual leadership team members and I explained to them what we were doing. And, um, and I talked to them about uh, our compensation deferrals. Uh, I felt uh, it was critical that as a CEO that I took the highest percentage deferral. It was just absolute and I, so I finished, let them know what we were doing. And, and, and actually one of the founders um, and, and one of the senior people in my leadership team came to me offline and says, um, I feel like I should do more. And I said, 
I'm not asking you to do more. And he's like, but, but is there more that I can do? And, and so I tell those two stories because nobody raises their hand like that if they don't trust that the rest of the organization is being managed in a thoughtful, transparent way and we're being truthful with them. I mean, no one literally just puts their hand up and says, please stop paying me, I'll, I'll, I'll go on furlough. Um, and, and in exchange for that, right? So we actually did accept the, the we, I didn't reduce uh, any more of the, leader, the, the leadership team member salary, but I did accept the offer for furlough um, because it was a challenging time. But the moment we got our PPP loan funded, the moment it was funded, I restored him to full time. And he was shocked because he had signed up for an eight to 12 week furlough. And three and a half weeks later, our PPP loan was funded. And I called him and I said, look, I hope this isn't too disappointing for you, but you're going back to work full time. And I mean, and he was thrilled. And I said, look, my obligation to you is that the fact that the federal government has now funded my payroll makes it incredibly hypocritical of me to not put you back on it. And you know what, let's get, let's get to work. And he's one of the hardest working people I have on the team right now. And so the, 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 the real goal in transparency is to make sure that you get this kind of communication. And I'll steal from um, uh, an author of my favorite business book, which is Ben Horowitz, who wrote The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And it's a fantastic book for people in high growth environments. Um, it is a bit unruly um, in, in, the, in the manner in which he speaks. Um, it is not the traditional business tone, very instructive, but more of a storytelling uh, uh, approach. And, and one of the things he talks about, and he talks about transparency in his book, but he also talks about make sure bad news travels fast. And, and I would love to tell you that this is you know, my idea, but, um, but as I read this, right, and I recognize this is one of the things that I really need to work on, right? As much as I'm, I, I love transparency and I love people talking to me, I'm a very passionate guy. And so you also, you also have to make sure that you create the opportunity for people to tell you when things are broken. I mean, because in a fast growth biz business, if you don't find out about a product defect, a deal you're losing, a customer that is just ridiculously annoyed with you, and you don't find out about it fast, right? It's gonna hurt and it's gonna hurt really badly. And so you have to create an environment where that same young manager who came to me with her idea can come to me and say, we have a problem. And, and I will say developmentally for me, right? Usually I'm just like, God darn it, right? And, you know, you wanna get, you know, you get fired up and you have to really make sure you don't shoot the messenger, right? You've got to make sure that they can be as transparent with you as you are with them. And so they're not coming to me with a P&L. They're coming to me with a defect in some software. And they've got to feel like they can tell you that. Yeah. John, thank you so much to coming here to talk about you know, the value of transparency. And, and really, it is something that does bind us together, provides connection increases trust, and increases the bottom line. So I really appreciate you sharing your ideas around transparency. Oh, not a problem, Gene. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, a little nugget of what I said resonates with somebody. Uh, I, just, I just appreciate having the chance to, to share my, my thoughts and my ideas. And, and uh, if there's ever anything else or any questions you or one of your listeners wants to know, I'd be, be happy to jump on, jump on the phone or exchange some emails. I just love interviews like this that could go on and on and on. We could go deeper and deeper into this one idea of transparency. Now, when you think about this, do you have red flags about, you know, transparency could, could really backfire on this or, you know, where do we draw the line? Well, my thinking behind this is if you have the courage to really be transparent with your people, they will have the courage to be loyal to you. They will have the courage to stick around when times are tough. John shared a few stories today about employees that are really demonstrating their level of ownership and how they're really showing up. Some of those have been around for a while. Some of those were fairly new employees. But when I remind you of this, make sure that you think about your own courage, your own vulnerability to be transparent where necessary. Transparency in the midst of a crisis is not just something that we do because of the crisis. Transparency is something you want to do at all times. My name is Gene Hammett. I work with leaders and their teams to help them understand the defining moments of their next level of success. All of my clients are very successful, but they know there's something else they can achieve 
level of impact. I help them get really clear about not just where they're going, but who they are at their core identity, what their values are. You may say that you don't need something like that. I would argue otherwise because I see people that are very successful that just become complacent. And I was one of those people. My story is, you know, I've told through this podcast many times, so I won't, you know, belabor it here. But I will remind you that my job is to help you get clear about who you are so that you can be the leader that your team craves. When you think about growth and you think about culture, think about Growth Think Tank. As always, lead with courage. We'll see you next time.